Okay, hello everyone and welcome to uh, September 21st uh, Legislative uh, Committee meeting. We'll start the meeting by, uh, I'll call it to order, and I'll be looking for uh, a motion for the adoption of the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Berry. Is there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Everybody's had a chance to go through the minutes of our last alleged meeting. I look for a motion uh, on the minutes. Council Waters, thank you very much. Is there any errors or omissions within those minutes? Seeing nobody waving frantically. <laughs> All those in favor? Carried. First up, Mr. Phil Rowe, what do you got for us? Uh, thank you, Worship and member of Council's uh, Council. At this time, I would uh, like to introduce Michael Roma, the president of RC Strategies. Uh, they're a Canadian company operating out of uh, Sherwood Park, and uh, they specialize in recreation parks, uh, trails, and tourism planning. Uh, they were the integral uh, uh, component of working with the town and county and the town of Mundare in building the RRCMP, so the Regional Recreation Culture Master Plan. And uh, they were uh, contracted to uh, work with us on developing uh, parks and open trails master plan. So uh, he's going to be going through the plan with you and we'll have a little time for some Q&A at the end. So Mike, take her away. Thanks, Phil. Good to see some of you again. Uh, good to be in person somewhere. I had my card, so just let everybody know I'm legit. I'm okay to be here, but uh, thanks for having me uh, nonetheless. Um, as Phil mentioned, uh, we did have, or I have, our company has some background in the region doing recreation and culture planning, but today's presentation is specific to some follow-up work that we've done in the town regarding your parks and open space system. Um, definitely builds upon that, that regional work, which those of you that were part of it recall, that was extensive <laughs> for, for sure, and, and this is fairly extensive work as well. Um, before I get into it, I wanted to say thank you on a couple of different levels. The first was that even though I realized that this was kind of a continuation on the grant that you guys got to do that regional planning, the timing of it couldn't have been better for our company. Um, I don't know if you recall when this would have actually been uh, approved, but it was kind of at the front end of the situation that we're in right now. And it was actually kind of like a CERB for our company. So I want to say thank you that uh, at, at that point in time, there weren't a lot of municipalities moving forward with any kind of plans. That's definitely changed now, but I really appreciate the fact that um, the opportunity was there for us to do this work. So thank you for that. I also want to thank Phil and his team. Um, as you know, uh, decision makers in the community, you realize that there's lots of things happening related to your parks and open space system, especially throughout a busy summer months a busy summer this summer and last summer um, with more and more people using the system. So in some ways it was hard to keep up with all of the stuff that was going on, but I think we have captured kind of the, the most up-to-date state of your parks and open space system and trails and so on, and uh, we couldn't have done that without Phil and his team. Last thing I want to mention is we did have a landscape architect help us with some of this work, especially the concept planning work. They were called Earthscape, or they are called Earthscape Consultants. And just wanted to thank another Mike that uh, that helped us out. Where are they at, Mike? That are they're at Edmonton too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And actually, they're uh, they specialize in some of the things that uh, were really relevant in this case. Uh, campgrounds. They do campground design uh, all the time, and general community park design too. So there. That's all the thank yous. So what I wanted to do, uh, kind of an old school presentation today, a hard copy right in front of you. I've got one in front of me too, and we're going to actually thumb through it, and I'm just going to kind of narrate as we walk through. I'm just going to try to hit the highlights, and then we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. Um, one thing to note about a plan like this is that it's, it's not meant to tie council's hands. It's not meant to tie administrators' hands moving forward. Um, thou shalt do everything that's in here in the exact order but it's meant to be a, a reference point for your decision making. Um, like I said, especially with 
so many different potential projects and projects on the go, it's good to have kind of a common place to start with and, uh, and also to help you make some decisions and help uh, Phil and his team move forward. So we start on page one and it really just talks about what the master plan is, what it's trying to achieve. Uh, it's about an inventory, it's about guiding decision making, outlining some priorities, outlining a vision for parks. Um, and also, in this case, we did include in the appendix a, a concept plan for, I would say, your, your gem of your park system, even though there's lots uh, for Pasenka Park. Can I refer to it as Pasenka Park right now? Okay, I'm going to call it Pasenka Park for now. Um, the next few pages, so pages three and kind of on, just sort of contextualize or set the context for a parks plan. So first off, talks about the benefits of parks. It's not just about creating healthier people, giving people a chance to connect. I think in this case, uh, probably resonates with council, um, definitely resonates with Phil and some of the administrators. Parks can be an economic generator for a community too. And there's actually some pretty cool stats in here as I get into it that you may want to refer to if you haven't been already and just positioning the community as kind of a a cool place to come and a, and a good place to live. Um, there's some information here, so pages five through uh, nine talk about trends in parks, um, trends in recreation. So again, this is building on the information that was in that regional plan, but this is specific to, uh, to just parks and open space, not broader recreation and culture. So climate change, uh, you know, nature deficit disorder, not sure if you've heard of that before, but it's, it's sort of a, I don't know, a sexy term that the recreation and parks sector <laughs> gets behind just to say that if you don't spend enough time with nature and outdoors, whether you're an adult or a, a kid, you're gonna be less healthy. Um, even things like truth and reconciliation can be furthered through your parks and open space systems. So again, a lot of this stuff is it's definitely interesting reading if you're into this, which I know some of you are. Councillor Barry probably you've probably read this. You probably have some edits for me on it too, possibly, <laughs> which are welcome. Um, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's just meant to set the set the stage and, and educate the reader, whether it's council or members of the public. Um, there's some information here about your population. So where possible. Uh, Again, we worked from the data that was generated in that uh, previous plan, but then we looked specifically at Vegarville. So there's this population information is a good example of that, as is the survey information that's a little bit later on. So just looked at your population, where you're at, and possibly where you're going. Section five is looking at all of the other documentation, other plans that you have in place that might have a bearing on a parks master plan. And we've outlined in that table on page 12 kind of the, the relevant features of some of these plans and then narrated them throughout. Um, I'll draw your attention to page 16. And this is something that was in the regional plan and has fed into some of the prioritization in this plan. So at that point, um, you know, we had multiple stakeholders around the table. We were looking at a whole bunch of different facilities and activities and services. We wanted to put a framework together to try to prioritize which ones we should focus on. So page 16 shows um, in terms of outdoor amenities and indoor amenities, what those highest priorities were from a regional perspective. So it's a pretty good chart to look at. I would say it's something that, you know, maybe should, revisit, should be revisited from time to time because there was a big system, councillors that were part of it would remember that, that led to the scores and the rankings, but it's a good reference point for if a community group comes forward or if you have an idea um, or Phil has an idea, you can see where it kind of sits on the overall ranked list here. Um, section six starts to look at the actual inventory of parks that you have in the community. And the first thing that we did was we came up with a classification system that'll help to sort of compartmentalize, I guess, look at a, a hierarchy of different park types, what they would offer, possibly how you'd maintain and look after them, and so on. And that classification system is on 18 and 19 there. And it includes community level parks. So those would be your biggest parks. Um, you can see Pasanka Park is an example of that. Neighborhood level parks, general green space and open space. 
and urban square and plaza uh, areas. And then at the following pages, uh, page 20 kind of outlines where some of those parks are and what kind of parks they are. And page 21 actually starts to get into analyzing uh, provision of those parks. And this is one of those areas where I think it might be interesting for some of your marketing materials possibly to, to start to reference this plan. So what we did in the, the next few pages here, um, it's kind of broken up a little bit, but I'll, I'll show you them as we come across them, is we took a, it's called geodemographic or geospatial approach to uh, analyzing your park provision. So we look at where people live, we look at where the parks are, the different kinds of parks or the different kinds of amenities, and then draw a relationship to, uh, or between the two. So you can see in the bottom of 21, it says 75, almost 75% of residents can access a park within 400 meters, and 95% can access a park within 800 meters. So that's a pretty cool statement to make. Like um, communities like the city of Edmonton have goals, like base level of services kind of goals set up to achieve a 400 and an 800 meter uh, provision ratio. And I know from a lot of the communities that, that we work in, these provision ratios, and I guess the overall inventory of parks and open space that you have is, you know, at the, the high end, if you will. Like you're, I, I never would say you have too much because you can never have enough of these kind of amenities, but you're well serviced compared to other communities. And that's back to the economic generator, back to quality of life in the community. Residents here have access to, uh, especially on a per capita basis, access to a lot of good services, which I know you're all aware of. And they, they probably don't always remember that when they're talking to you about <laughs> maybe an issue they have or whatnot, but they, there is a very good level of park and open space provision here. So this one's about just access to general parks. Um, on the following page, uh, same thing, but looking at population density and where your parks are located. So even though there is a good level of access, there's also quite a few parks in those more dense areas in the community. It's, you know, it's good to look at it in, in this light. It's a little less relevant here than it is in like a major metropolitan area, obviously with varying densities, but still good to see. Um, on page 25, we did the same kind of analysis, but only with play structures, so playgrounds. So, Two-thirds have access within 400 meters of a play structure and 90% have access within 800 meters. So again, another good, good news story. Um, when we get into page 27, I hope, Your Worship, I hope this is okay to do this. Is it okay? Is this well, going I, all right? I like how you keep pointing out that we're overachievers. Okay, good. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> great. I, I don't see anybody dozing off for anything, so this, no. this way of going through it's okay? Okay, right on. Um, so... Page 27 and kind of afterwards talks about your existing trails and pathways. And I think this is an area of interest probably for council and for your community. Trails and pathways are the most important, most popular, I guess, if you relate that to importance, most important amenity that you provide in your parks and open space system. And what we have here is, a, I guess, your first and most accurate GIS layer of your trail system, which I know your Phil and his staff will use moving forward, but also not just what existing trails are, but where some potential or proposed trails would be. And I know that council and Amin have talked about this, but this is a good visual to actually show all of those potential linkages that could be made and potential investments that could be made. Page 28 and 29 um, look a little bit in a little bit more detail at your trail and pathway system and actually have the same kind of a classification system for your uh, pathways. So we have mapped routes. You can see there's a current supply. There's also a kind of a discussion around what the design characteristics would be. Multi-purpose recreational trails, or recreation trails, park pathways, and natural trails. So now when, um, I guess uh, Phil comes to you with potential projects or residents ask about your trail system, you can show them where they are, but you can also uh, demonstrate that you're kind of taking a strategic approach to providing those trails, maintaining those trails, and, and so on. So um, that's kind of the current system. 
that's kind of what you have right now. There's trends. Section seven builds upon the engagement that was done in the development of that regional plan. We were able to take all of the data out of the regional sample size or, or the, the regional uh, presentation and highlight just what town residents said back then. So this section gives you a good indication of, I guess, your resident preferences and uh, perceived importance of open space and so on. So we didn't do, as part of this process specifically, we didn't do any um, kind of broad-based surveys or anything like that because we could build upon the work that was done in 2018. But this is all specific to the town. And all of that information leads to, first off, a foundation for providing parks, which is kind of like a philosophy that the town has moving forward, why you invest in parks, what kind of you know, outcomes you want to see, and then into uh, kind of some actions and uh, policy initiatives and practical things that can happen to, to make this come alive a bit more. So that starts on page, uh, if we go to page 37, there's a vision for the parks system. So you can see our parks, trails, and open spaces enhance our quality of life and nurture the well-being of our residents, our environment, and our economy. Blue sky, fluffy words for sure, but still important to ground decision making, to justify your investment, your ongoing investment in these kind of services, these valuable assets, and uh, again, demonstrates you know, why you're in the, the parks business. There's some outcomes discussed there as well as some strategic themes related to how you might make decisions, how you might move forward. Again, just things to think about, um, not necessarily to be very stringent and set in stone for every decision. You don't have to check off a, a list or anything like that, but just good ideas in terms of uh, moving forward with parks. And then starting on page 39 and carrying through pretty much to the end of the document, there are some strategic priorities and actions. So this one's a good one to start with. So it talks about trails and pathways on page 39. We show your current <coughs> linear distance of those different kinds of trails classifications. Um, there's a proposed additional, uh, either committed or proposed distances of the different kinds of trail types. And that leads to kind of a future vision of almost 36 kilometers of trails in the community. Doesn't mean you need to get there tomorrow. You may not get there in five, 10, 20 years, but at least there's something there um, for you to, to aim for and build towards. So on the following page, there are some policy actions and some practical actions. And I don't wanna get into too much uh, detail here. I'll handle questions about the detail if you have any but it, that's where I might lose everybody because it does get into a fairly uh, intense level of detail. But on page 40, just as an example, the policy actions for the trail system would be around signage, around design standards, making sure there's consistency and so on. And the practical actions is actually, um, you know, making sure that those things are implemented. So seeing signage, seeing consistency and so on. Page 41 has some examples of what those suggested trail or pathway connections would look like, where they came from. Um, some of this was from your existing uh, community plan. Some of it was you know, based on our research that we did in the community or, or what we heard from Phil. Um, in terms of outdoor rec facilities, again, there's some policy actions. This is on page 43, some policy actions and some practical actions. So really the policy for those outdoor rec facilities or those active, um, active spaces in the parks and open space system for the most part is maintain your current supply. Again, you have a pretty high level of service already. Quality of some of those spaces, maybe, you know, it's not consistent. So maybe some work could be done to, to maybe normalize or standardize that quality, but not necessarily seeing any need for, for more of those, you know, sport field spaces or uh, those kinds of things. The one thing we have noted here, the third bullet under policy actions, which I do want to bring to your attention though, is look to incorporate or develop physical accessibility a little bit better within the park system. And this is a pretty common thing that we mention now with municipalities and uh, thought it would be important to mention um, in this case too. In terms of practical actions, there's a few items here that uh, we are suggesting you could um, 
you could sort of add to the system, not necessarily related to those active but more passive spaces like dog off leash areas. I mentioned campgrounds. We think there's a bit more work to do in terms of business planning around the approach the town might have towards campgrounds. Uh, we did get into that in a lot more detail with Phil and have you know maybe some more insight to share there, but not as part of this master plan. Um, disc golf uh, at Pasenka Park and reinvesting in existing event and gathering areas. Uh, page 44 talks about parkland and open space. So you'll see that this, uh, I should have mentioned this, but it kind of follows the classification system, right? So every section is one of those new classifications that you have. Um, park naming was something that uh, we thought was, you know, maybe important. Hence, I wasn't sure if I should refer to it as Pasenka Park or not. <laughs> A little bit more clarity or consistency around park naming would be good. Um, Maintaining that current supply ratio should be of focus. Again, it's good. It's what your residents have come to expect. Um, it sets you apart, but you know, being at the top also means having to, you know, kind of concentrate on on those service levels and maintaining them and so on. Um, the last uh, couple sections here. There's the last, yeah, the last two sections. One talks about stewardship and programming. So this is a bit about how you animate your parks and open space uh, system, how you educate the public about the importance of it. Um, things like outdoor classrooms that can maybe combat some of that nature deficit disorder that I'd mentioned. Um, and a few other practical actions are mentioned here. And then in terms of planning and development, there's, um, some specific kind of directions that we've outlined here on page 48. So all of that culminates into a, a table on page 50 and 51 that kind of uh, consolidates all of those implementation actions, outlines who the lead would be on that from the town's perspective, and also provides some timing. So we, were, we did say short-term, ongoing, medium-term, long-term, we didn't want to give you any more direction than that because we would be tying your hands if we said 2024 or 2026 or something like that. But in regards to prioritization and giving a bit of direction on maybe where to start first, um, that's where, if I was looking at this, I would refer to the, the timing column because it does give some indication there. And then the last two pages of the document, 52 and 53, were, I guess, a bit of a a value add that we were able to do with um, the resources that we had in the project. This is where we hired uh, Mike from Earthscape to come. Uh, we looked at the entire park system and he provided commentary in, in general throughout, but he was also able to look specifically at Pasenka Park. Um, had a few conversations with Phil about this, visited the site, looked at the research, and we came up with this concept plan that um, it is actually at a stage where you could take this uh, if council and admin were happy with it and actually engage a contractor to do some of this work. So there is detailed kind of drawings to support this image that you see. Enough to hand off, not, uh, not a, a kind of stamped set of landscape drawings, but enough to engage a contractor or town staff to move forward. So. That was actually only 20 minutes. I thought it might have taken 30 minutes, but that's an overview of the document. Um, I guess I'd ha pass it back to your worship and handle any questions sure. that council might have. Okay, who wants to start? Not you, Councillor Barry. Who else wants to start? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, your worship. I'd like to say, Mike, it's good to have you back in town. Um, I'm really pleased to see that the work that took us a year and a half or so uh, on the first plan, hasn't gone just into dust. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it's been used very well to come up with this plan here. I think it's gonna serve the town really well. I know I just scared you because I'm not editing. I'm hoping <laughs> that you will though, David. I, it makes it better, so it, I'm, it, I'm um, game. <laughs> it's really good, it's really good. Thank you. Thank you. Through your worship, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Wallach. 
I, I just wanted to double check. I believe you had said through page 32 and 33, and we talked about the facilities and the outdoor priorities in there. I know you had said they were specific to the town of Vegreville, and you said um, these were specifically um, responses from residents within the town or users of the facility. I just want to check which one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh your worship through the councillor. This is, so there was a variety of different engagements that were used in the regional plan. This represents the household survey, which was statistically reliable, and this is the public responses. So it doesn't, I mean, through kind of osmosis or however you want to say it, there should be uh, the priorities of your groups represented in here, but this is specific to the general public. And we did that deliberately just because as is the case with any kind of recreation and culture amenity, it can be easy to listen to uh, those that are passionate and organized in a community. And it's good to do that, and that passion is in integral to what makes our communities our communities. However, they don't always represent the general public interest. So that's why we took this tact and included this piece of information, because it should kind of cover all of that. Those that are in organized sport or organized activities affiliated with groups and those that, that aren't. And even more relevant in a parks and open space setting than in a kind of broader recreation and culture setting because parks and open space, you know, we didn't have a lot of organized sport over the last couple of years and they were still the most, like there was lots of activity in our parks and open spaces too. Councilor Rudy. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very detailed, and so there's lots for us to look at because we didn't get to see it too much before the meeting. I do have um, two quick questions. Um, I'll stay on page 32 and 33 just because that's where Councillor Warwa's question was too. I'm wondering, so this is data that was collected before. I wonder what kind of inverse um, data set there would be given the last year. Um, so even you know, the frequency of the social centre in usage for people as compared to walking trails, I, I think would be exactly the, the reverse, potentially, which kind of lends itself to my next question. And forgive me if I don't remember which page it is on. It's talking about the accessibility in the inventory, about how close people are to um, park spaces. So I, I want to say that's maybe page 25. Is that the, the right one? Yeah, think? it's close to there. I'll find okay. it. So my question, actually my comment first is that this is great to see this. Uh, many years ago, the Child Development Coalition was trying to do community assets and be able to take an inventory of what was available for children, especially the zero to six age range. So this kind of data is much more advanced than what we were using at the time. So this is great to see. My question would be um, the proximity to people uh, being able to reach park spaces, is there a way to be able to dissect if it's actually the people it's intended for? So for example, mm -hmm. I can see on the previous document you've got high density housing, for example, might be, you would think that it's families with children that would be most likely to live there close to parks. Is there a way to be able to differentiate that? Just so for future planning, mm -hmm. that we would be aiming it towards a neighborhood that is, you know, cycling over to a next generation of families that may not be serviced yet by parks so that we can do that predictable planning where they should be in the future. Mm -hmm. Do you have that well, in Lots here? there, Councillor, through your worship. So thanks for that. First off, I'll address um, the first part of your question around utilization. And you're right, we don't know where we're gonna end up after we don't have to show our card anymore, or if we have to show our card forever, or if we have, like, nobody really knows where, um, kind of participation is gonna settle back down at. Um, there was a lot of research in the height of the pandemic that said all of our sport groups are gonna be bankrupt and we're not gonna have activities anymore and so on. And that probably is real to some degree, but there's also been a lot of sport groups that have bounced back probably, what is it, four times now in terms of providing programs and shutting down and coming back. So we really don't know, it's too early to, do you know another survey or ask residents about this because they don't know yet. I would say probably within hopefully another year or two as things calm down, it would be a good um, good thing to do, reach out to community again. And we have said in here, and it's hidden, but I think it's just good governance that you should have kind of ongoing discussion 
ongoing communication with the public, with the users of your services. So this would be the same as some of the other elements of you know town services that you provide. So I, it's a good comment. I can't you know predict or I can't say with any level of certainty what the difference is going to be, but I would say that it wouldn't be valuable to try to ask people that right now because we're still in a bit of a state of disarray. Um, the other comment or question that you had about that, I call it geodemographic analysis, a big long word. I'm trying to fit as many letters in as I possibly can there, but um, it's, a, it's a way that as planners, we're starting to look at communities and it is, it is good information. So what we've shown there is um, the extent of what's publicly accessible Sometimes if you want to know more about your population, you have to pay for that information either through StatsCan or through, uh, their, I call them market segmentation companies, but there's companies that bring all data together and they think they know what you're going to buy tomorrow at the store <laughs> because of, you know, again, I call it stereotyping a little bit, but it is, it's, it's based on multiple data sources. It can be pulled into a recreation and parks context. So your question about can we look at not just the family makeup, you can look at economic uh, status, I guess, income, ethnicity, background. You can even get information that, uh, again, I'm, I'm not gonna vouch for the accurateness of it, but it's there that has people's own self-perception of physical activity levels, of mental health. Like it's, you can get it costs like 15 to 20 grand usually to get it and to put it into a model like this, but you can get it. So I think that might be a conversation that you uh, have with admin or think about moving forward. We wanted to give you a bit of a kind of whet your appetite for this kind of analysis, but within the resources that we had for this project, we just couldn't go and buy some of that stereotyping data, if you want to call it that. But it's a good question and it hopefully is a way that the recreation and parks world, I'd say in the general community planning world is going to go because that data is there. We just, as municipalities, we don't think about it too much or we don't even really access it. You know, Coke, Canadian Tire, those companies have been buying that data and using that data for a long time. That's why, you know, relevant uh, ads come up on your phone right after you talk about it with somebody or when you searched it yesterday. So it's coming give you a taste of it, but uh, I can't give you more right now, sorry. So, Mike, uh, isn't it a pretty standard thing that you do, like the residents uh, access a park within 400, 800, or they have access to uh, play structures 400? Would you say this is a very good bar barometer that we could measure ourselves with other communities? Where we're at, or yeah. So the 400 meter is uh, a pretty common standard for things like kind of smaller park spaces, uh, sidewalks and trails, and if you have a transportation system like a bus network or mm -hmm. something, they'll use that for bus stops too. So the 400 meters is a pretty standard. It's about a five minute walk, and then the 800 meter is obviously a, you know twice as far, but it's also a fairly common uh, measure that's used. In other provinces, it's very common for a community to say, like, that's our goal, to give everyone 400 meter access to a park or 800 to a playground or something like that. In Alberta, we actually don't do that that much here yet. So it's not like every community within your size would, would have adopted a standard like that. And even some of the bigger ones are leery <coughs> to adopt a standard, because as soon as you do, if you're 95% or 90, or in this case, you're only two thirds 400 to a play structure, mm -hmm. That's a good news story, but it's also the other third of your population can come back and say, well, I need a playground within 800 meters, and they actually have a bit of a case, yeah. right? So there's a bit of a reluctance. It isn't a, a, a common thing to see a community out there and putting it on their billboards or anything like that, but it is as common a reference point as you'd get in uh, most municipal services, not just parks and open space. So we'll be able to sort of like figure out where we're fitting in if somebody else has the same stats as we do. Yeah, exactly. And I would say that this, again, your overall provision, I think I, like I hope I, hope I was clear about this, you've got a healthy level of parks and open space. Some developed, some that's waiting to be developed, 
like when we came and did our, our tour, so this is myself, I've been doing this 20 years, Mike the landscape architects, he's, he's over 40 years in for sure. And we were just constantly surprised every turn we took. Phil's like, yeah, that, 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 that's, yeah, that's ours. Here's some, you know, more fields over here or whatnot. So it is, you, you do have a healthy supply. And uh, that is something that really you should, I mean, this is kind of a personal uh, uh, anecdote here, but I think you should be telling people that, you know, showing them that because that's one of the values, the offers that you have for people to, to live here, for sure. Okay, well, just a, there's a measurement there, like a barometer of where we fit. I mean, 62, 63% uh, residents accessing the play structure with 400 meters. I mean, we know that we do have a few problems in certain areas of town that probably drag that number down a bit for us. But it wouldn't be that hard to make it better too yeah. and and it, when it comes to your audience for that stat like i mean you might be wanting to to uh, compare with other mayors or whatnot but it's really about residents right about their pride oh, i would just i wouldn't say the truth I <laughs> yeah <know>. exactly <laughs> but they they probably don't know like i said it's not a widespread thing mm -hmm. so they probably don't if they were in Vermilion, Vermilion doesn't have this for sure. You know, like other oh, I know the mayor there. I'll let her know. That. <laughs> they don't have that that kind of target, and they don't have that kind of analysis that we've provided to you. So I would. Well, that's all I needed. I'm good now. Oh, you're good. Okay, right on. <laughs> no, I, I I appreciate it, but just uh, as we're making decisions and moving forward, and mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain level that people can have expectations for, and to have a common measurement, uh, like a, mm -hmm. something that we can base things off of, mm -hmm. is good. So I. Yeah, there's, and there's some amenities in here, and uh, it, it kind of talks about them a little bit, but there's some amenities that you would want more geographic representation of, like uh, off-leash dog parks is a good one, and I know Phil and his staff are, are actively working to, to spread those out a little bit, but you can do the same kind of analysis that we did here for playgrounds, play structures with any of your amenities. Sports fields, ball diamonds, not as, you know, not as big of a deal, because typically drive to and programmed you don't you don't go and play out your back door. You usually have to drive across town to play <laughs> or whatnot. But there are some things that are more relevant for that that kind of spatial analysis too. Well, and it's nice that, that you gave us the, a list of importance and in, mm -hmm. in, in, in in the community too, and, and that's based on data that was collected right here. So, yep. I mean that's something that we can always use. So, I mean the whole report looks very good. I can hardly wait to sit down and have a conversation with Councillor Barry about it. But. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome any edits or suggestions that you that you have. It should maybe say draft on here, even though it did go through a variety of drafts, but we're more than willing to adjust it if you want us to adjust it too. Anybody else have any comments for Mike? Yeah. Questions? Good job. You can say that a little louder. Yes, uh, Mike, a very good job. It's uh, detailed and it uh, gives us something to digest. I had one question, and it was around um, what you're seeing is People who are willing to uh, relocate, are they looking at what you offer? Because uh, there's a balance between uh, infrastructure, equipment, and green spaces, and investing your uh, your tax dollars wisely. And uh, I'm just curious to see how many people are looking to move to community uh, because they offer parks, playgrounds, and open spaces. Uh, in, from your experience. Uh, Councillor, through your worship, that's a really, you know, I'm a, I'm a cheerleader for recreation and parks. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, my answer is going to be biased. I'm the president of the Canadian Parks and Rec Association right now. So, like, I spend time in front of Justin Trudeau's cabinet, still his cabinet, right? Or well, you lost two members. Oh, just two, whatever. But I'm, like, advocating for it. So my answer is going to be biased, tremendous value, tremendous uh, amount of... Uh, uh, kind of add that that has to the attractiveness of your community. I do think, and again, this is just like participation. We're not sure where that's going to end up after all of this. The other thing that we don't know um, how it's going to settle out is people working from home or working remotely. So I have a job, again, personal anecdote here. My job being a consultant in this world, I was doing 20, 25 flights and 50,000 kilometers was the last year of travel I had before the pandemic hit. And this is my third council presentation that I've done 
since March, like almost two years, one and a half years. And I'm going to do this as long as I can because I can kiss my kids goodnight mm -hmm. every night and my wife for that matter. <laughs> and, uh, and I got way more productive time. So if you have a lot of people that, are, that have the flexibility to be able to do that and can still be effective, then they're not it doesn't matter if they live downtown Edmonton or if they live in Mundare or Vegreville. <laughs> I said Mundare first there on purpose. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter where they live as long as you have some of those things that make your community attractive and internet. You're going to have to have really good, you know, quality internet, which I know is not as big of an issue here, but definitely bigger for rural municipalities. So this isn't a I'm not a future teller and I'm not an authority on, you know, where that's going to end up, but just from my own personal uh, belief, I think the more amenities you have, the more attractive your community is, and if people settle into a home environment, that's going to be really good for, I'd say, smaller, well-serviced communities like Vegreville is. Bill, you had a question. Thank you, Worship, and uh, to Council Emco, uh, Mike uh, and I, uh, through this process, uh, we did uh, we did reference a few times. Uh, there's the uh, 2020 Canadian City Parks report, and I could send that link to Council. Uh, that was a, uh, a nationwide report that was uh, that was done specifically to parks and how it affects uh, communities. It was broken down into many segments. It's a it's a huge document. I'd uh, I'd be willing to send that link to everybody. It's a it's a good read on where parks is nationwide in our communities so mm -hmm. okay one other thing that you identified here Mike is that we don't have a lot of names on our parks mm -hmm. and you feel that there's a bit of a civic pride thing to have names or there's something that we're we should be take a little more interest in or uh, it's a good question your worship I would say it's less about what the name is and it's more about consistency across the system like I think how you go about naming your parks there are a few communities out there that are actually looking to have sponsorship for their parks. So not naming it in memoriam or, you know, with community leaders. I mean, there's some examples of community leaders, uh, parks named after community leaders that are having to change. Sir John, somebody, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So so there's, there's a lot going on there, and I think it's more a, a community choice as to what road you take. But having consistency is really important for residents and for visitors to navigate around the community they want it they want it to be welcoming I mean I well I don't know about all of you but for me if I see a newer nice consistent kind of signage program in a community it just legitimizes things quite a bit for how much it costs to do so so consistency in the naming of it and consistency in how it's aesthetically presented so I have a picture that actually, again, back to Pasenka Park, I, I know it's very important and I don't mean to pick on it, but I've got a picture that I took from my car, actually the same place I probably was when I was three driving through town, um, where there's three different signs and three different names for the same park. So that is, in essence, the issue that we're trying to get at uh, with that recommendation. How you name it is, you know, that's a tough political decision possibly or administrative decision, but that shouldn't be the case because it's confusing to me and it doesn't look like a well kind of oiled machine or a well managed system if there's three different, you know, not only names, but designs of the sign too, right? Like yeah. feels of the sign. Get it. So the setting mayor should be named the parks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That can be a legacy. <laughs> And I, and you I, don't I get, get a you, pension plan, but you get a park yeah, named after. I get where you're going, and in, in our sign each presentation from the other day, of course, this was brought up, and mm -hmm. this where the the Pasanka Park uh, came in there and stuff. And 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 I do agree that it, being consistent on what you're doing all the time, and I know for a lot of like, probably you, know, you could talk to ten people in town on one park, and they'll all give you a different name. Yeah. Who was the uh, who cleaned up the most over there, or? when it get going or who lived closest and, and everybody has a different name on those parks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Berry. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, to Councillor Lemko's question to some extent, um, we've actually done three surveys over time since I was around here eight years ago. We've actually done three different types of surveys 
And the citizens have basically always said the same thing, that natural green spaces, walks, all those things are the most important things. So this document here is summarizing and bringing that together to show just how important uh, this recreational plan or this type of a parks plan is. Because in each of those surveys, basically they came down to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think it's right on, right on the mark from, from that perspective. And it's, uh, for me, it's a long time coming. <laughs> Good. Yeah, and, and your worship you. through the councillor, I would say it's, even, it's probably even stronger than what these surveys or those past surveys suggested because there has been definitely more intense use and more intense importance placed on these once you can't go anywhere else but the party system. Yeah, good point. Okay, anybody else? Seeing that out, well, Mike, I want to thank you. And uh, we've been hearing about it uh, over the summer and we knew it was coming and we can hardly wait to sit down and take a good read on it and, and to give us a, a path forward in, in what we do and how we plan what we're going to do. So we do appreciate it and uh, thank you and your company for doing it. Thank you. Best of luck to all of you who are running again and I am kind of tearing up that you're not running again too. I heard that. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Have a good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Phil. Uh, FTSS, the grant funding. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, this is a letter from the VTSS, uh, Vegreville Transportation Services Society, uh, from September 12th, dated to your, as Worship, uh, Tim McPhee and Town Council. Dear, dear Mayor McPhee and Town Council, on behalf of Vergable Transportation Services Societies, I would like to thank you for your decision to once again provide funding to our organization. The generous grant in the amount of $22,000 was greatly appreciated. This funding will help to solidify the fiscal footing of VTSS as we navigate into 2022 and support consistent levels, service levels in the future. There is no way that this letter can adu adequately convey how much VTSS appreciates your generosity. Our clients are greatly enriched by this service. We would also like to thank Council for the invitation and opportunity to discuss VTSS as a whole and the need for transportation within our community. With thanks, Elaine Kucher, Program Coordinator. Okay. That'll be on Monday's uh, docket. Thank you. Anybody have any comments on the letter? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Bodjak. I'm just wondering, have we sent an invitation yet for VTSS to come and make a presentation? Because I, I believe it'll be an important um, topic for our budget process. Not at this time. We haven't uh, discussed at the administration level uh, in our budget talks who would be invited or who we're going to be talking to at this point. Uh, your Worship, in the past um, with new councils, what we have done is uh, brought in different um, or community organizations and uh, professional organization that the town deals with uh, to make presentations. So um, I think for uh, it would be uh, prudent to do that again after the election. Uh, for the new council. Good. Make it happen. Thank you. You got one more left, though. Yes, thanks uh, again. Uh, this discussion is about the Vergerville Regional Historic Society. Uh, as I had uh, spoke to uh, council before, uh, we're in the process of uh, making the, uh, the name change from the Museum Society to the Historic Society. Uh, We've started the process with uh, corporate registries to have the, the name change. Uh, at this point right now, we do not uh, if think it will affect the AGLC calendar. Uh, that's what information we got from society so far. So at this point right now, we do have a set of draft, draft bylaws and some policies and procedures. <coughs> so this is not a town uh, board. It's a, a board of the public. Uh, what the request from myself that I put this together now is uh, council to 
promote the new society uh, and a board to the public, uh, perhaps using some town resources to uh, market this board and basically get it up and, and running. Uh, council would have to make a motion to be, have this added to the org structure. Uh, we do have uh, uh, both a town rep and a county a council rep uh, in the draft bylaws. Uh, that, of course, would have to be. So <clears throat> we can't adopt these. This is have to be. We have to put the group together. They would form the form the society based on these bylaws, and uh, and of course yourself uh, and Mr. Craig through uh, the county manager and the county reeve. Uh, to also get regional involvement because it is a regional historic society that we've put together. Uh, and, and this goes beyond uh, the museum. Uh, there is a museum component in terms of uh, how that would uh, look in the future, but there's also an educational component uh, about the, the history of our entire region. Uh, it could be educational tours uh, of of the community of, of the region. So there's a lot of components in in the historic society that we put together. But where we sit right now is we're, we're waiting to hear back that uh, the bylaws, uh, the name change is approved. And if that moves forward, which I, I don't foresee any reason it won't. So now is the time basically we have to basically go out to the community and say, uh, we need we need people to be on this new society and and start the ball rolling. Okay, who has uh, some thoughts on this? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. I appreciate the update. Um, I think that if we can move in that direction, uh, it would be very good for the community. I think it's a it'd be good to have a broader um, membership, um, get more people involved and uh, have an active society that actually does look at the culture and history of the area. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this comes together and I would support um, administration and the town trying to promote and, and getting this society up and running. Thank you. And of course, with any, with any uh, public society, uh, it's the board of directors. So a president, vice president, and a secretary treasurer, uh, Ultimately, that, that's what needs to happen first and then uh, and get more and more members involved. Uh, I did design this as uh, lots of working groups, uh, just my, my knowledge of uh, societies in, 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 in the public, finding people to lead the groups uh, is always the challenge, but getting people involved. I think there is a, an opportunity in our community right now to get people on board uh, especially in some of these working in these working pods or groups of, like you say, museum education, uh, you know, tours, all of the, all of the things that we had uh, put inside here. But the, I guess the the challenge right now and what the def, the direct need is a board of directors. Go ahead. If I might, just as a follow up, your your worship, I do have one question. The makeup of the society, is there room there for just members at large, people who just want to be a member of the society and then volunteer now and then, but not really be part of a board or um, of directors or et cetera, just, just members of the community that are interested in culture and history, um, contributing in one way or another, just generally? Oh, yes, absolutely. The, the, the concept behind this society is... Uh, is the board of directors is is five people. Uh, after that, it's it's members at large, and uh, the more members, of course, we can get. And that's why I designed it with the the little pods of education website, you know, educational tours, museum, so that there was this opportunity that you know, if person A wants to join, and you know, they really want to just dabble into the history. Uh, anybody that's on Facebook uh, obviously has probably seen the, you know, you're from Beggarville when, uh, you know, that's, those are things like say a picture just gets put on there and it generates, you know, tons and tons of comments of, you know, people like, you know, well, I remember this and, you know, I've learned more, I think, of that town history just from watching those. It's, 
you know, just to see, oh, because people in back in history will say, well, this is what it was. And I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. So, yes, there is a member at large component for sure. Okay, so could you send us out a copy of your bylaws that you, you put together for this so we can take a look at them? And can you ask uh, if they want res representation at the big house next door? Um, you go ahead and put all those together. If they don't want to be part of it, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I would ask that first, that question of there. If they want to have a member on there. And uh, let's try to get the community excited about this. I wouldn't use the word working groups, and I wouldn't a lot to, to start. Just try to keep it, because no matter what, you, you could draw it all up on paper, but if you're going to ask people to volunteer and be part of this, or they may have their own thoughts and stuff too moving forward, right? So we can't be so strict or, or, or the, with the, within the framework of what this is going to represent because people are going to bring their own ideas. Anyway, whatever it's going to take uh, for uh, the municipality to help sell this to the community and get people excited about coming onto this board, you know, we, I think we'd all support that. Cliff, go ahead. And this is a, a draft bylaw that would have to be adopted by the society. We've put a, a, a number of things in there, which may or may not be incorporated in the end. Oh, and we could call them interest groups. How's that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I do believe it's a worthwhile thing and uh, being regional and, and having a lot, a lot of different uh, people's interests in different ways. And then where, where we were with just with the museum because it got to be a very, just a, a very focused uh, thing there. So, yeah, so whatever we can do is, uh, you know, have some, uh, some meetings, uh, some town halls regarding this moving forward and, and other people's visions will be important too if you're, if you're going to ask them to get on this committee, so. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody else have anything? Okay, thank you. Uh, Corporate Service Director Paul Casey. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. This is a uh, regard to the tax sale that we held, or that we held on September 13th at uh, 10 a.m. in Council Chambers. We had three properties for sale. We had nobody attend the auction. We had no bids for the properties, and we closed the sale. And um, now we're in the process of transferring title from the original owners to the town as a tax forfeiture notice title. Is there anybody still within any of these properties living in them? Uh, I believe there might be somebody in property three. Property two is vacant and property one is a vacant lot. Yeah. Okay. So, but this is the way this works. The, the process will start going in the next step so that's all we can do right and if there is someone in property three and they are renting that place then we will instruct the former owner that the renter is now to pay the town and the, pro and the proceeds received from rent will go to pay down whatever's owed on the tax as a property that we recover and and then we will also have obviously inform the renter of oh, that good. and um if we get paid all the taxes from the rent, then it'll just be turned back to the original owner. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. I see none. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, town manager, Mr. Cliff Craig. Uh, we have the uh, marketing plan or for uh, Foxview Estates, and I'm going to have the creator of this presented being uh, Jameson Brown. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Craig and your worship and council. Um, so if you uh, look to your screens, then this marketing strategy for Foxview Estates specifically should also be included in your package, but there were elements that were not going to uh, transition to paper, specifically videos. So. Uh, I understand that it's been already an, an afternoon when it comes to presentations, uh, and I'm batting cleanup, so I'm going to do my best to keep you engaged but not keep you long. Um, we'll get right into it in terms of the marketing strategy and uh, in terms of what we're going to be focusing on throughout. Uh, branding, website enhancement, social media advertising campaigns, uh, marketing for free, which I'm sure is uh, everybody's favorite subject matter, and then of course uh, a potential execution timeline. So uh, as we turn our attention to branding, at present there is no approved logo for uh, Fox View Estates. And, uh, 
I don't uh, want to go down the, the rabbit hole of uh, the logo. I know that we all spent a lot of time uh, talking about uh, the town of Vegreville logo, and uh, it, it, this is not something that has been set in stone. It was just essentially something that I sort of uh, pieced together using our, uh, you know, um, I, I guess our color palette, for lack of a better term, and then just trying to establish some sort of a brand for uh, for Fox View Estates. Uh, it's uh, pretty simple, uh, obviously. You've got the uh, uh, town of Vegreville Gold Fox. It's simple, it's identifiable, and uh, the, the fonts, I feel, do conjure up thoughts of palatial estates. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of logos when it comes to branding because uh, especially as it pertains to social media, to signage, it is just an easy way to link one's thoughts together. So if you're trying to sell a product and then someone happens to see that product up for sale, it immediately connects the two dots. So uh, this is a, a, an essence, uh, or uh, in, in, in simple terms, a proposal proposed logo for, uh, for Fox View Estates. One of the big things that uh, we would need to focus on out of the gates before we start um, selling Fox View Estates, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, some website enhancements. Now, when it comes to the world of websites, there are, in essence, two types of websites. There is a, a website designed strictly for information, or entertainment consumption purposes, and then the other is sales. And uh, right now, vagreville.com does a pretty good job of being an information website. It is not a sales website. So we would have to make a few design changes. Um, and these are good news changes that I could implement on the back end. We don't need to get too, uh, you know, uh, too elaborate. But uh, here's what the uh, current um, lots for sale page looks like at vegreville.com. Um, you've got several redundant Google map flags indicating multiple properties in the same location. I understand it because I live in this community, but if someone who doesn't live in Vegreville doesn't you know, have a, a vibe for the community, doesn't have an understanding, it just looks like a bunch of redundant flags. Uh, they don't understand that these are potentially segmented lots and it just, it actually immediately portrays a bit of a negative image. Like, oh my goodness, look at all of the stuff they've got for sale there. Um, we would have to change that. Um, in, in terms of the multiple listings list, underneath those flags, underneath those uh, property locations, you've got the uh, more detailed, for lack of a better term, assessment of those properties. So you've got the price point, you've got the address, but for uh, in terms of a sales component, there is uh, still some left wanting in terms of trying to actually make that sale. And finally, even the listing details where you were to click on one of those uh, listing lists, um, it, it, while it offers location, offers the price, and it offers how you can get in touch with people, even under the details. And I know that you know this is government, uh, price per acre, irregular. Uh, you're not gonna sell many lots when, you, when you're describing them like that. You're just not. <laughs> Immediately, I'm conjured up going, what's irregular about it? And why would I want to buy an irregular lot, right? I, and I understand that at the end of the day, we have to try to change the website slightly to ensure that we're trying to make this section a bit more of a sales section. And in short, we're asking buyers to do too much, to work too hard to find information that they're just going to give up and go somewhere else. So what I'm proposing is a, you know, a, an adjustable and a certainly manageable change to uh, the lots for sale uh, portion of bigreville.com. Um, we've got the logo there. So again, any social media marketing, any marketing in general that's done, they can immediately go to the website and the dots are connected. They see, oh, this is what they were talking about on, uh, on the commercial, for lack of a better term. Uh, you've got a detailed map. And don't mind the prices. These are just prices scattered throughout. But And don't mind the sold. Don't mind any of what I've proposed. These are all just hypotheticals. But what the solds do is it immediately um, hammers home a point of urgency. We're, we're not doing currently, if a lot sells, we're not taking it off, or we are taking it off, but people who didn't 
realize that there was a lot there prior, don't have that sense of urgency. You start to see these lots go sold, sold, sold. Then all of a sudden, you begin to get a little panic going, I'm about to miss something huge, right? It's, 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 uh, it's a sales trick, and I don't even like using the word trick. It, it does present the urgency, and I think that based on some of the marketing and based on where we're positioned, um, there will be some urgency here moving forward. The details are pretty well laid out in terms of whom they should contact, how they should contact, and uh, how they can get their hands on one of these lots. Um, the bottom portion of the page would be essentially some cost comparisons, and these are from August, and uh, uh, I think that our target demographic would be larger cities where it's become almost impossible for people age 35 and under to buy their own home right now. Um, this, the, the mortgage stress test is unreal hard. <laughs> I can speak to that uh, with a little bit of experience because my wife is in banking. Um, but on top of that, if you factor uh, the mortgage uh, stress test and you, you happen to clear that hurdle, the affordability factor. So again, in, in some of these graphs that I think it's important that we relate to potential investors when it comes to residents in our community, um, you've got the average price per detached single family home in Edmonton at 4000 or $472,000. Uh, I did a little bit of research. I, I contacted a, a local realtor I know, Wink, uh, you know, and uh, she informed me that the average price of uh, detached single-family homes sold in Vagraville in 2021 was somewhere around the $220,000 range. These are things that we need to pass along to our potential investors, our potential residents, um, and it gets even more in-depth. The down payment required. So you're going to need at least $23,000 in Edmonton based on that uh, uh, average price. In Vagraville, you'll need $11,000. Your monthly mortgage payments. Uh, uh, almost 2,000 in Edmonton, 930 here in Vagraville, and the monthly property taxes. The one thing people forget when they talk about property taxes is uh, it's based on the value of your lot. So your average property tax is $377 in Edmonton, it's $223 here. And that equates to about a monthly saving of $1,200. Uh, and I, I really do feel like, given our target demographic, these are things that we need to be hammering home. Uh, and then the next infographic shows uh, uh, exactly uh, what you're going to get uh, when you're comparing uh, apples to apples. So I found two uh, uh, homes in both Edmonton and Vegreville. $309,900 was the price for both of these. In Edmonton, that gets you a duplex, four bedroom, four bath. In Vegreville, it gets you a detached single family home, five bedroom, three bath, detached garage, attached garage, sunroof, deck, fireplace, and central AC. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what you're getting in Vegreville for a 45, 50 minute drive. And I really do think that these are important stats and points that we need to be hammering home. So once we make these changes, these enhancements to our website, we've now set the stage for uh, it to be a little bit more welcoming to try to uh, you know, capitalize on any social media and, and ad campaigns that we do moving forward. And the first one, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, the, the, the essence of these campaigns is that we're not selling a lot or a house. What we're selling is A, a chance to own a home. I've already touched on that. A lifestyle, more space, less crowds, more time, less stress. And our town. Um, we just had a gentleman here talk about the proximity to parks, but we're, you know, we've got a proximity to everything. It takes me five minutes to drive to the arena. It takes me five minutes to drive to the grocery store. It takes me five minutes to drive home from work. Um, these are things that when you start to realize, and it's been a while since I've lived in the city, but I was there this past weekend, man, to get from one place to another took me half an hour. There's a good, even if you're living in the city, even if you're living in, or uh, living or working in the city and living in Vegreville, you get a good chunk of your weekend back when it comes to running errands because it just doesn't take you that long to get from point A to point B if you're doing those errands in Vegreville. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be doing when it comes to targeting and uh, the, the heartstrings that we're going to be trying to pull at. So the first is an ad here, and I'm not sure, just before it goes too crazy, I'm going to try to pause this, because I'm not sure if you guys will be able to hear the volume, and if you can't, then that sort of defeats the purpose. So bear with me, because I didn't have a chance to test it. Uh, 
I'm going to exit and actually turn my computer volume on. So there we go. And now it's going to be aggressively loud, so I apologize. I don't want to blow anybody away with the sound. Imagine paying less, but getting more. More house. More yard. More time. More space. More fun. More room. More life. Get more. Build your dream home at Fox View Estates in Vegreville, Alberta. So that would be uh, one of the ads that we would uh, target in uh, in the Edmonton region on social media. Um, our platform would be Facebook. I know that there are a lot of other social media platforms, but uh, a recent Hootsuite, even the July 2021 in Hootsuite is essentially um, a, a program that social media marketers use. But Facebook is still by far and away the biggest platform when it comes to social media. It's, it's not even close. So uh, we would focus our efforts there. Our target demographic, 25 to 39. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, target region would be Edmonton. So that's flight one, add one. And uh, I'm going to have to, uh, no, actually, these won't require any volume. But uh, essentially, these are um, get more shorts. So, you know, it gives you an idea. These are all drone footage videos that, uh, y y that's one of our, you know, actually, I believe that's the Northeast Loop, um, uh, a jogger running uh, the first uh, video on your left. Uh, the next video to the left is, uh, of course, our fantastic aquatic center, uh, our golf course. And these are amenities that I think uh, you know are going to be important when it comes to positioning our town and letting people know what we have to offer. And then finally, our uh, our our splash park, our spray park. And those are shorts that you throw onto Instagram. Um, they, in a sense, our amenities sell themselves. You've got people using them, and uh, you don't have a crowd of people. I, uh, a couple of summers ago, was visiting a friend in the city, and his backyard wasn't bi uh, big enough to accommodate all of us, so we went over to the park. Holy cow, it, they should have been selling tickets. Uh, it was uh, uh, so busy that you almost didn't feel comfortable. So I, I think that these videos do a great job in trying to hammer home that we've got beautiful amenities right out your front door, and you don't need to worry about someone breathing down your neck. Uh, our next page is uh, marketing for free, which everybody loves. Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, these are would be the second flight, uh, marketing for free. I guess the slide got mixed up. Um, we'll start with a video on our left. Uh, now, these are generic stock footage videos, but specifically talking about the lifestyle component in Vegreville versus the lifestyle component in, uh, let's say, Edmonton or uh, a major market. And the second, uh, about life in terms of what we were just talking about, running errands in the city.
So that gives, uh, again, people who are unaware, uh, a little bit more of a, a backstory on Vegreville while keeping it light. And uh, again, that second flight uh, wouldn't be as much of an investment. Uh, I would focus more on our amenities in the, you know, at the, that first video when it comes to a, a larger ad buy on social media. Uh, and then now talking about the free marketing options. So um, ads like this that you're seeing um, could be posted all over our community. And I obviously mean in a classful, tasteful manner, but we have you know, several town-owned digital signboards at uh, places that people are visiting from out of town on a regular basis, like the Wally Fadoon Arena, like the Aquatic Center and more. Uh, we've got the digital signboard located at the Elks Kinsman Park. And uh, boy, you talk about the traffic that comes in there. There's no reason why we shouldn't be telling people about what we've got for sale. And uh, finally, even on our homepage and other key pages at uh, vegreville.com. Uh, and finally, a bit of an execution timeline. And again, these dates are subject to change based on you know when we get the official go ahead. But the website enhancements wouldn't take long, uh, You know, potentially by October 8th, depending on when a decision to move forward would be. Uh, flight one, in terms of running these ads on show, uh, social media, uh, the 11th to the 24th, uh, flight two, the 25th to the November 7th. Um, uh, the implementation of uh, free marketing options could be done almost immediately. We'd want to make sure that the website enhancements were done. And then finally, the uh, campaign assessment, where I would come back to uh, council and talk a little bit about who we reached, how we reached them, the uh, clicks through the, the ads to the, uh, to the website by the end of November. And uh, that is it in terms of the presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free. Hey, thank you. We'll start with uh, Councillor Warwick. I guess mine's a bit of a comment more than a question. I think it looks very good, very clean, very easy to follow. Um, I do, just from some of my experience, appreciate the little short ones as well. I never really understand, understood the word of the whole world of uh, short videos, but now uh, in the role I have, in my day work, I understand the need for those little Instagram videos and those Twitter ones that are under the time frames. And um, it's actually surprising how long, how many people come on. And we also just recently did some um, data collection that showed even very informational videos uh, that the average person drops off by the 30 second mark. Uh, so you could have an amazing, amazing video that's 10 minutes long and they're gone after 30 seconds anyway. So I think it's a great job. That's basically all I'm going to say on it. Uh, the only thing is when you said we don't want to go too far down the <laughs> rabbit hole of the logo, I love the way the logo looks. It looks professional, clean, and uh, looks like a community that would, I would say, looks like a, a high in demand area. So that's all. Yay. Uh, Councillor Waters. Yeah, great presentation. And I agree with the, the shorter videos. Um, myself, I don't even put the volume on. I just let it roll through. But um, just one thing, we are fully fiber and people are working from home. I don't know if that's something we want to capture as well in our presentation or is that kind of like another offshoot? I mean, uh, my vision when it came to the actual posts uh, were, was to hammer home the, some of the um, amenities, including the, the fiber functionality um, in the actual post and then the video underneath. I think that... It's amazing how many people just take it for granted in terms of the internet. Um, if we're trying to exclusively sell the fast-paced uh, internet, people would assume that that's available everywhere, especially if you've never lived in rural Alberta. So while I would hammer home the point that yes, in our actual post above the video or below the video, depending on the platform, that hey, we've got you know fiber internet or and, and throw some stats in there in terms of some of the other amenities while keeping the message short above or below the video. Um, that, because of who we're targeting, a lot of these people probably already assume or they just take it for granted that the internet is fast everywhere I go because chances are they've never really experienced life outside of the city. Uh, it's one thing that we've got in our back pocket and it's certainly something that we'll be incorporating into any marketing material when it comes to business attraction. Uh, and it is certainly something that we could look at when it comes to uh, videos for, for new flights, but you're not wrong. It's, it's, a, it's an absolutely essential service and it's one thing that Vegreville uh, should be immensely proud of, the fact that we've got that type of internet that we can offer to new residents. Just one more thing. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so the slide where you had the lots and you had the prices and all of that, 
I know a question I get a lot, being the realtor side of it, the square footage to a lot of people doesn't mean anything. A 50 by 150 lot means something. I know the irregular size lots you can't do that with, but just maybe the square footage would draw them more to click on and, and ask more questions, but it's just something that, just a thought. Well, it's my hope that I could lean on, I don't know, I, maybe I can find a real estate agent to offer a little bit of assessment and some advice when it comes to making those enhancements to the website to ensure because uh, there's certainly a, um, an expert uh, amongst us when it comes to uh, real estate and what sells and what doesn't. And uh, I would hope that that, uh, that expert would be willing to uh, chat a little bit more about it. There's a very good chance. <laughs> okay, well, um, oh, sorry, Councillor Lemke. Uh, well done, Jameson. Yeah. A very good presentation. Um, on a funny note, uh, I love the logo, except the fox that lives out there right now is a little skinnier. Uh, but I, I want to add uh, something. Uh, this weekend at the uh, corn maze, we had uh, some folks from Edmonton come out. And uh, they're immigrants to uh, Canada uh, coming in. Uh, uh, one gentleman came in the fall of uh, 2020, and another one just arrived in April. And they were talking to me about the beauty of, of uh, the country, because they're settled in Edmonton right now, and they're not sure where they're going to settle themselves permanently. But they uh, love the fact that it was open spaces, uh, country uh, living, uh, and uh, they were asking about uh, uh, stuff like fiber, and, and this is a great video that we can share with those kind of people who are willing to invest uh, in, in a business in the community, but also in uh, living in, in Vegreville, because uh, uh, they don't really know. Uh, and this is something you could share as, uh, with us as a, uh, Council, so that we can share it with those people who are, are asking us. So, good job. Thank you, and absolutely, I, I can make that video available. Okay, uh, Councillor Rudy. Uh, thank you. I was late to the <coughs> game, but got to get a sense of this even just uh, reading this in my agenda package. This is uh, amazing. So, for those of us that have been, I have an old file folder in my emails that's called If You Lived Here. That's originally what it was called, and we've gone from having. Uh, pieces of paper in a flyer section at the arena to having um, a more mature actual marketing plan. This is really exciting. I'm so happy to see the, the development from um, just trying to get people to pay attention to what we have to actually being able to market and have pricing for um, our lots, even the, the development of having policy to be able to have a, a logical, logistical way to be able to share that information. So. This is very exciting to be able to see that. And as Councillor Lemko finished off with too, the whole idea of people may end up here by accident, but we want them to stay here. And, and it won't, they won't just happen to come to a corn maze and make an, uh, a decision like this to buy a home immediately. So this is exciting and I can't wait to see how many more houses, how many more stars get lit up on that uh, sold. So thank you very much for preparing this. Thank you. Councillor Bear. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm going to echo a lot of this. Um, definitely, I liked the logo as soon as I saw it. It just, it was there. It was perfect. I also like the short, quick presentations because my attention span is 30 seconds, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Councillor Lemko made a very good point there, and I was thinking about that as well. When we do have these events like the fair and the corn maze, the Sanka days, et cetera, et cetera, having a table or a area set up where this video is looping or this type of information is looping so that when these people come from outside of the community, if they happen to be walking by, they get this information. Because, yes, there's a lot of people coming from outside of Beggarville uh, to some of these events, and an awful lot of them are coming from Edmonton, and a lot of them are new to the area. So they, they, I think they fit your demographics perfectly. So I, I think that that would be also a, a really good way to market it, is just to have that TV looping at these events uh, to catch their eyes as they're walking by. But otherwise, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ali, and also um, thank you, Jameson. This is exactly what we were looking for uh, through our economic development, uh, and it fits, ties right into uh, the rebranding of the town of Fagerville. So it looks awesome. And yeah, I wouldn't change a thing. I really like that uh, Fox View States logo that you've designed, and, and again, the short videos as well. So looking forward to this, to moving on with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, there you have it. It's nice to, to see, uh, you know, that Min has been listening to what we want, and what we've been asking for, and this is part of the momentum that we've been looking for, for our community to start rolling and, and developing sales and interest in our community. So again, good job on everybody, and uh, I can hardly wait to see some of the results that are going to be from this and what's coming up next. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so... Next is me, and I have a letter from the mayor of Crossfield, Joe Tennant, and basically they're in the same mind thoughts as we are regarding Bill C-21, the changes to the Criminal Code and the Firearms Act, that we do, they do not want it left in the hands of municipalities across the country. So we'll have a receive and file on that on Monday night. Uh, yeah, we have two other letters that were written regarding the restriction exemption program. And one is from uh, Sheila Stenberger from Mundare, and the other is from uh, a, a local resident, uh, Jim Sheets. And there's another one that we received this morning. So I, we have a special meeting tomorrow, and I would like to hold these letters until tomorrow. And if there's anything else that we received uh, tonight, or uh, we can read them all together. Is that acceptable to everybody here? Okay, then that's what we'll do. Thank you very much. And now we're going to go into our round table. So where did we start last time? Nope. We're going to start with Councilor Waters. Okay, well, I don't have a lot. Uh, just on the street, people talking about the election and new COVID restrictions and that kind of thing. So um, that's all I have. Good. I mean, there's just some days that you don't have a lot. Well, Council Lemko. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, lots of talk on the streets regarding the uh, restrictions. A lot of people asking questions. And certainly uh, some uh, trying times to determine what we're going to do or what I'm going to do as a councillor if I have to make a decision. So uh, it's a bit of soul searching. Second to that, um, I want to thank everybody for coming out to the corn maze and those people who... Uh, showed up and enjoyed the, uh, the weekend. Uh, a lot of travelers from outside the community coming in to see what Vigerville has to offer, uh, as well as a lot of local people coming out. And, and I must add that uh, social distancing was uh, quite evident in a lot of places, and people were respectful of each other's space. Uh, it was a, a great weekend, and we certainly look to uh, those people from the community who haven't got a chance to come out again. and. Uh, and spend uh, some time out in the outdoors. Thank you very much. Councilor Brodzia. I don't have a lot as well. I just wanted to um, make a comment that I'm looking forward to uh, Mr. Lefebvre's report on our uh, road resurfacing projects that we're doing because I, I can see that um, they are progressing, so that's encouraging. I know it is late in the season, uh, but it is, uh, I guess, a factor of the economy right now. Uh, other than that, um, just enjoying, hope that everyone has enjoyed our, uh, all that we've done with the parks and recreation this year and looking forward to, I guess, some of the um, decisions to be made and hoping that the province will uh, step up to the plate and not download it on the municipalities. I think that's a... Touché. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. A um, little bit of some of the same. Uh, I've had a number of residents reach out to me either through email or telephone calls or personal messaging um, relating to our topic tomorrow, so I think I'll leave that. I appreciated the calls, but I'll, I'll leave that discussion until tomorrow. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say is, is that this weekend at the Corn Maze was a fantastic weekend, and I think we're going to have more of it. Um, 
but I would also just say kudos to Councillor Lemko and his lovely bride for their um, Bell Mountain, which really took a beating. The kids, <laughs> the kids finally, the kids finally really, really uh, were over, all over that. And I understand that he's now made arrangements to get some more bales hauled out there, uh, so that we can. Uh, I'll give you a hand. We'll rebuild it. It'll be there, just as tall and as beautiful as it was last week. Thank you. Councilor <laughs> Rudy. Um, people have been talking or reaching out about um, our discussion tomorrow. Had a lot of messages, a lot of uh, um, conversation about that. And uh, as well, excitement about seeing some work happening because I've had to have a interesting pass to get anywhere out of our neighborhood uh, with all the construction. So that's exciting that that's coming forward. And just to circle back to the letter that you just received, Your Worship, um, I'm attending virtually uh, FCM quarterly board meetings and the uh, topics of discussion that we just had were about RCMP funding, Bill C-21, and national utility corridors and making sure that um, those issues are carried forward in the next 100 days to the federal government. So um, I'll say also to, uh, to our newly elected MP, congratulations to MP Stubbs too. Um, it's great to be able to have a partner that we can uh, be able to call on and ask for assistance as a municipality. So. Thank you, and now to the campaign queen, we'll call her as one done and one to go, uh, <laughs> Councillor Warwick. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess first I would say I've maybe received a few less calls because people were anticipating I might have been a little bit busy during these last few days. So I'm really happy to be um, able to refocus on that. Uh, just want to start with the corn maze. I was able to be there over the weekend and really nice time. So I was really excited to see that. Um, I too would say I didn't have a lot of other, other than I have gotten a lot of uh, calls and correspondence again about our topic for tomorrow with the restrictions um, and any possible discussion. I, I would say that um, I just want to make a comment about that and it's not about our talk about it, it's just about receiving information as a counsellor. It's very important and um, I haven't brought in, uh, forward specifically my letters because they were addressed to me. Um, having said that, I think that for myself personally and I think it's fair to say from what I've seen of this council, each one of us takes it very seriously what we're hearing from the residents. What I sometimes fear is that, and this isn't a criticism to public outreach, it's just a general, sometimes people will only reach out if they, to the councillors in particular that they think will represent a certain way. And I just think it's important to tell the general public that reach out to us regardless. Don't assume the way that we would feel about a topic because for myself personally, I often represent based upon what I'm hearing. So I've received dozens of calls and they were all completely 100% in one direction. Um, so I just encourage people, whether we're talking about exemptions, we're talking about parks or whatever we're talking about, reach out to council, let them all know whether you think they would agree with it or not because a lot of times our decisions and how we'll represent is based upon what we're hearing. So I just wanted to bring that. Um, I won't get into the rest till tomorrow, but that's what I got. Okay, thank you all for what you do and uh... I know that uh, this topic that we're talking about tomorrow uh, is, has been uh, well talked in the community and uh, we will let our thoughts go tomorrow on that. Uh, as far as what I've been hearing uh, uh, otherwise, I went to the, uh, the, the corn maze on Saturday and I was quite amazed uh, the artsy work that's been done out there and I took a walk through the, the maze and uh, you know, unbelievable. The, the little uh, trivias and uh, the questions and the stuff that as you're walking through and I never seen anybody there didn't have a smile on their face well maybe the the mascot but it was hard <laughs> to tell but uh, and I attended uh, the drag racing a couple of times it was out there and I also went to the uh, the new uh, Junior A program uh, they were having there some trials they had some European players and I met some of those to on the weekend so Good job, everybody, and uh, that's all I really have to say right now. So let's move on to director's highlights, and we'll start with... Yes. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, since we are probably got a fair amount in there, is it possible we could do a quick five-minute break? Okay. Thank you. Five minutes. Thank God you said something. <laughs> 